this year, and it's called Lumavia. And it's a new mode of action um, on the insecticide side, and it's kind of the active ingredients sold as Renax appear. But one of the things that we're really excited about is not only is it giving us some better control of some early season insects, it's also a very environmentally safe kind of type product. So I mean, you guys have heard about the you know, bee colony collapse, the pollinator kind of type issues that we're having with say like a cruiser product or something like that. This one here essentially has uh, low to possibly no impacts on the, on the pollinator. So we're kind of excited to bring this forward, get it tested. And you know, it's also very low toxicity to mammals like us. Um, so that's always good anytime that we can ex you know, reduce our exposure to some of this stuff. So kind of in comparison on some of the other seed treatments that are being currently offered on the market, you know, what does adding Lumavia to the mix kind of do? And you can kind of see here we stepped up from where we've been, we're getting a little bit better control on wireworms, white grubs. A big pickup is uh, cutworms. And then another uh, big pickup here is, is armyworms. And I guess one of the things that we're excited about the whole cutworm, armyworm activity is as we continue to use more and more cover crops and uh, this far north with cover crops probably in order to make them work we're going to have to do something that overwinters and greens up in the spring to get any benefit from it and for those of you guys that have grown rye maybe taking it off as silage or whatnot what happens typically when you take off some rye and it goes back to a corn or soybeans what usually shows up usually either cut worms or army worms and so that's where I think the Luma Via will really fit in for us, help giving us some protection, especially on some of those acres where we're going to be killing that cover crop off and then coming back in and, and planting some, some uh, grain crops. So, All right, clicker question here for you guys. What precision ag components are you guys currently using in your operation? So yield monitoring, maybe grid soil sampling, variable rate applications of maybe either nitrogen or seeding, variable rate seeding. All right, 23. All right, so quite a few of you are using a whole bunch of different things and you know, at least essentially yield monitoring, things like that. Um, one of the things that you'll also see coming forward from Pioneer is what we call our Encirca Services Suite. And essentially what it is is a whole bunch of different things that can hopefully potentially maybe help you guys out with uh, managing your operation and making better decisions, I guess is what the ultimate goal is. And so we got some precision ag tools in there with variable rate seeding, variable rate nitrogen, uh, nitrogen monitoring actually is a pretty interesting component. I'll show you a slide on that. Uh, we do have a really nice system of weather stations being put up. I think uh, Brett's got one right out here. So uh, you'll see as we get to the nitrogen monitoring, monitoring part, uh, rainfall information obviously is very key to, to monitoring nitrogen loss. And we've got some markets on there. And if you want to see what Brett and myself or John or Rob are taking for notes out in the countryside too, that's also in there. So when we go into a field, we evaluate the health, you know, what stage it's at, soil moisture and things like that. That's also available through in circuit services. So. Uh, one of the things that I talked about, you know, was variable rate seeding, and I guess we've done a lot of these seeding rate studies here in the in the past three to four years. And what's been interesting is our yield in these fields. That's what we always get asked, Troy. If I do variable rate seeding, can I increase the yield in my field? And I guess what we're finding in these fields that we're doing these seeding rate studies is 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 actually we can, on average, you know, if you just would have picked one seeding rate say 34,000 and just planted in, on average in our fields, you would have had about 184 bushels to the acre. Now by taking a look at elevation, different soils, previous yield histories, you know, in those poor spots, those light areas where we know it probably can't handle the 34, 36,000, we back off to maybe 28,000. And maybe in those spots that really have good heavy soil, maybe we bump it up to 38,000. And then take a look at what that would do. You know, there's about, eight bushels there that's hanging out there that we could potentially get. Now that's hindsight looking back, you know, everything being perfect, but we figure if we could capture even 50% of that, 
that'd be four to five bushels because we're never going to guess right every year because we can't always outguess mother nature but for those of you guys in the previous slide that said you've been doing yield monitoring for quite a few years what we do is we overlay those years of yield data and say okay if this field part of the field's always 10 15 percent off the average of that field we know that it just can't produce so why why put the seeds out there to you know stress it even more so there's some potential there and that's one of the things within circus services that we're getting at and looking at some different components like elevation and things like that one of the, probably the neat things here is the nitrogen tool or nitrogen monitoring tool and that's where having a bunch of local weather stations around the countryside like brett has here is uh, going to help us out so what it's essentially doing is it's taking the soil within a particular field and you can input what you're putting on for nitrogen so this is a snapshot that i took back in october of this field that i had worked in here the previous year and what it's trying to do is uh, monitor the nitrogen in the top 24 inches so it knows the approximate soil type it knows where you're located at so it kind of looks at historic weather it looks at you know things like when it, we started warming up this year and things like that and you go ahead and you can see that this guy made an application with his weed and feed of UAN 28 percent you know with the planter right at planting time so his nitrogen obviously was running low he bumped that up and then a few weeks later he put on his side dress application now, now obviously anytime that we want corn anywhere from you know V8 to shortly after tassel we definitely want to make sure that we're in the green zone and so what it's doing is it's keeping track of your nitrogen form that you put on it's keeping track of the rate that you put on and then it's also keeping track of temperature and rainfall for that for that area and so what our goal is is hopefully um, as we test more and more of this is can the model accurately predict based on rainfall temperature in your guys' application whether or not where we're at if we're in a safe zone for our nitrogen or are we kind of getting on the borderline should we think about coming back in with a side dress application so it's kind of a neat tool we did have about four or five fields here in Iowa this year that we tested it that's going to go up to about 50 next year and so far the the results look pretty encouraging if there was ever a year to test a nitrogen model it was it was this year with all the rainfall that we had so ending on that with uh, nitrogen how many of you guys read or heard something about a little uh, thing going on in Des Moines <laughs> with nitrogen and you know not only do we have that we've got EPA rules coming possibly on corn rootworm management you know what kind of traits and when you guys can plant them in your fields we've also got the waters of the US going on and things like that and you know I guess I guess we can look at like I said earlier there's always two ways to look at everything we can we can get upset about it we can say all those beeping you know politicians and environmentalists or we can be proactive about it and try to promote what we're doing out here because to be honest with you there are a lot of good things going on and we need to tell people that less than you know I think it's down to almost a one percent of people in this country are directly involved in agriculture so that doesn't give us a whole lot of votes but was, what we have to do those use things like you know Facebook and things like that social media to show when we're doing something good out there that we promote what we're doing because you start we're starting to get backed into a corner here and we need to be we need to be as aggressive as possible and as and as positive as possible about changes that we can make but also the good things that we're currently doing the meeting the other day Happy boys you know mm -hmm. right there in the South Dakota yep they said what you guys got to do is get our gravel reporter check the water on the north end of Des Moines and check it on the south end of the water they did that at Sioux Falls South Dakota and on where the water came out south Sioux Falls it just went yeah. right through the roof and everything eats a lot of farms in, in yeah <laughs> yeah and the interesting part about the Des Moines Water Works too and this is something maybe when you you know people are jumping on as farmers about is where does the nitrogen go that they take out of their drinking water they, put it back in later. they dump it right back into the river but the, his his comment is is that well I have a permit for it farmers don't 
And so I guess it'll be really interesting to see what they're trying to do. So farmers have been exempt because we're considered a non-point source pollution, you know, because technically the stuff coming out of the Des Moines Waterworks or out of a city sewer or whatnot's coming out of a pipe. So that's a point source pollution. Well, do you guys have any pipes coming out of your fields? We got a lot of pipes coming out of our fields. And so that's where they're going to try to take the angle and say that it's no, it's not, um, that tile water is not a non-point source pollution. It is a point source. So I guess I don't want to belabor the point, but there's some really good things going on with the nutrient reduction strategies, some tests and things like that. Anytime that we can implement any of those practices, that's great. You know, you look at the trend, there's more and more acres of side dressing every year. You know, that's a great way to help protect water quality, also protect yield. And, you know, the one thing to remind people as well, if you look at nitrogen application rates over about the last 20 years, you talk to guys, well, 20 years ago about how much nitrogen were you putting on your corn on corn? Well, about 200 pounds, maybe 210, 220. How much are you putting on now? Well, about 200 pounds. But look what our yields have done. And, and I think a great story that we're not telling is the amount of bushels per unit of nitrogen that we're growing now has dramatically improved over the past you know 10 15 years so we're actually we're being more efficient with our nitrogen we're producing more with the same amount so anyway just kind of wanted to bring those up be active and like i said the only people to give farmers and agriculture a good image is you guys and there's a lot of good examples out there of what's going on that's positive and of course you guys know the media they'll drive down the road and they'll find the one situation out of the dozen that's bad and they'll make it look like that's how that's what's common so be proactive and uh, I think we can tell a good story so with that I want to thank you for your business appreciate your guys' time today and if you have any questions or whatnot I'll be you know we'll all be ready to, to take them so what kind of questions or comments do you guys have yeah uh, in the past, I was under the impression that under good conditions for aphids, they, they double their numbers every couple days. Mm -hmm. It looked to me like I was I was scouting fields and I'd see 100, 150, you know, it's not, not pretty troublesome. And two days later, I'd see 1,000. Yep, so there's a couple things that can happen. If you look at a, at a colony that's staying put, um, the, you know, usually about every three days or so, they can... Uh, they can they can reproduce and, and double now the other thing that could be going on too as well is they're also mobile so let's say for example someone else's soybean field was starting to mature and yours was still nice and green they can get up there's a certain percentage of or what they call winged aphids they can get up and fly and move as well so you can usually see that on your mic on your mic i mean under a yeah, a lot of times with a naked, a lot of times with a naked eye you can, yeah. but I guess sometimes too. Not only are the ones flying in, but if they fly in and then immediately give birth, you know, if you have 150 and then all of a sudden maybe 300 fly in and then those 300 give birth to, you know, another 300, then all of a sudden boom, just like that, your population has just exploded. So yeah, it can change quickly, and that's why we need to stay on top of it with uh, with scouting. So yeah, if you guys have ever, um, you know had, had uh, your wife or someone say, you know, man, if it wouldn't be for carrying on the species, you guys would be worthless. Well, for a male soybean aphid, that's actually true. The females are actually born pregnant, so they don't even have to mate. So I guess if you think you got it rough, be a, <laughs> be a male soybean aphid. Great question. What else, uh, what else do you guys have? Yeah. Has anybody ever done any study with this insecticide as far as aphids? say it's got a, such a residual but how good is that residual rob you might you probably <laughs> sprayed more acres than me so jump in here at any time I think where you're going to get into problems is that uh, you spray at any given time uh, you've got that plant protected any new growth after that you're going to want to be out scouting and you're going to it's going to be susceptible so yeah. so it can uh, it can get you back to threshold and the other thing too is how much rainfall you know if we start washing a bunch of that off of the leaf and that's where i guess i'm a big supporter of another reason to support soybean seed treatment we've got the gaucho in our uh, premium seed pioneer premium seed treatment and actually that does that's a systemic insecticide 
And so it does a really good job of moving throughout the plant and protecting the whole thing. Whereas like Rob said, if you come in with a foliar application, you're going to protect what's there the day you sprayed. And we know that the soybeans continue to grow. And so those areas won't be protected. Now those soybean seed treatments do eventually run out, but you know, study after study shows it gives you another seven to maybe 10 days of protection. Gives you a little bit more time to uh, push that window back. And I think the further you, you can, push that window back when you do finally come in and make that insecticide, you know, foliar application, you know, we've got a week to 10 days less to worry about protecting. Would it be fair to say that makes your field maybe a little less attractive than potentially the neighbors it's not treated if that does? Yeah, c c could be. Yep. You just talked about the full treatment on soybeans in a drilling situation. Can you change the rate because you do it? You put the full treatment on? Can you plant less? So can you plant less? Um, I would think you could possibly back off a little bit, but I'd like to know where your seeding rate's at to start with. You know, so I guess in narrow rows, you know, I personally, when you look at, especially, I'm a big Iowa State fan. I mean, I tried and true. I mean, I'm still an Iowa State football fan after this, this uh -huh. past year. So, I mean, I bleed cardinal and gold, but I do not, uh, believe their seeding rate recommendations. I look at the University of Wisconsin and a good example is they have a soybean yield contest and the guys that are winning that are in that 185 to 190,000 seeding rate in narrow rows. You know, in, in, in Iowa State we're talking what 120 seeding rate to get 100,000 final. So I guess depending on where you're at with your seeding rate, if you're at 180 in narrow rows, you could probably drop that 20,000 if you're if you're treating, probably the same way with narrows. What's your narrow, seven and a half or 10 or 12? Or Anything under 15 and under is what I would consider narrow. Good question. And, and really, to be honest with you, the value that I think um, comes in with soybean seed treatment is, you know, we can show you data all day long that the fungicide part gives you a bushel and a half, the insecticide part gives you a bushel and a half, so you're gonna probably at least break even on it every year. But the thing is that I've seen over the years is it really dramatically lowers your risk of having a replant situation. Maybe the white grubs moved in or maybe Pythium or Phytophthora moved in. And the big bonus there is from the time you plant your soybean seeds to the time you figure out you have to replant, how much time's expired? A few weeks, probably at least. You know, we just lost three weeks of growing season and you know, planting beans end to, end to May is really what shows us that we can really max out yields. So good question. Any others? You just talking about your corn seed treatments now, your new one. Mm -hmm. Do you have new products in some of your corn this year? Or? So that new Luma Via will be on all of our new products that'll be coming out that'll be just be getting introduced this year so a lot of that will only be in plots um, there aren't too many hybrids that we're getting a planter full so uh, most of it will just be plots so we'll really be able to um, and the older products will not have that seed treatments so we'll really be able to tell the difference and how well that that new seed treatments working this year and then in 2016 you guys should be ordered be able to order all you want of it good question Yep. What we're at, so. Yep. What's coming down the pipe? Yeah. Anything else? On on beans. Pardon me. Uh, per bushel, we're probably looking at getting close to two, well, almost two pounds of K two O. So you can figure ninety units for sixty bushel beans, roughly. Yeah. If you wanted to. Yeah pretty close anyway at least yeah probably so then you know when you figure that back to pounds of potash that you actually yeah, got to apply here, over 150. yeah so about 150 160 pounds of potash just to barely keep up with a you know 55 60 bushel soybean crop so it adds up pretty quick good question anything else great questions i appreciate your guys's participation and if you can leave your uh little clicker on the on the seat. It doesn't work on the remote or anything at home. And <laughs> I was telling Brad earlier, usually there's one or two always go home with people. And, um, but if you can leave them there, that's great. And thanks for your time today and have a, have a great year, guys. <laughs>